Good afternoon. This is Kyle Welch with RCR Wireless News. Thank you for attending Smarter Connected Technology, the direction of Java for connected devices, presented by Jamalto, Oracle, and Qualcomm. Our presenters today are Terrence Barr, Senior Technologist and Principal Product Manager at Oracle, Joe DeCamp, Product Manager at Qualcomm, and Axel Hansman, VP of M2M Strategy and Marcom at Jamalto. Just a reminder to everyone that within 24 hours of this webinar, we will provide you with a link to the on-demand version of today's webinar. During the webinar, we encourage everyone to submit their questions via the control panel, which will then be answered at the end of the presentation. With that being said, at this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Terrence. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to start my section by talking about building the Internet of Things with Java. Let's move to the first slide. So the Internet of Things means different things to different people. Um, we view it as a game-changing technology and it really represents the convergence of embedded mobile, social media, uh, big data and cloud technologies and it has the potential to reach into every aspect of our lives uh, and every industry from healthcare to logistics to smart cities, the environment, retail um, and, and many other areas. Um, and I'd like to look into uh, a little bit why that is and why the Internet of Things is so different from what we've seen so far. Next slide please. So in the traditional model um, that we have today, devices are typically connected directly to the internet, typically to a server, and the data gets displayed um, on a website somewhere. Um, it's, it's collected and maybe stored somewhere, but primarily it's really used for humans to be able to view this data. Um, if we go to the next slide, there are some driving factors that are changing that. Um, devices are becoming cheaper, their resources and processing power is becoming larger, and most importantly, they are connected. Most devices today are connected in some way, either permanently or intermittently, and that allows devices to really start connecting and interacting with each other, which brings us to a new topology, the Internet of Things. And what's really significant here is that, that this model changes very much the way we in, interact with these devices and the way services are defined, built, and delivered. Um, and by having these devices interact with each other, we can create new services, we can create additional value, the data becomes more valuable, and we can create new business models and new efficiencies uh, that help us really take advantage of these opportunities. Next slide, please. But there are a number of challenges. Um, once you have this system of the Internet of Things where many devices talk to each other, there are a number of new challenges that we face. Uh, first of all, we'll obviously have a wide range of different devices and technologies connecting to each other. So it's, it's a rapidly changing uh, landscape of technologies that need to interact with each other. The hardware keeps evolving. Every you know, 12, 18 months we see new capabilities, new types of connectivity, more resources, more processing power. We need to adapt to that. Um, increasingly, the software is driving the value of these devices. So the functionality and the value that's provided to the customer and the service that is implemented really is key uh, part of the software structure and the hardware sort of fades in the background in terms of uh, importance. There are a number of uh, features that fundamentally each device participating in this network needs to have. Uh, there needs to be security, there needs to be connectivity, the devices need to be manageable. So these are core features that the infrastructure needs to provide and we can't spend our time reinventing that wheel over and over again. Volume and value of data keeps increasing, right? That is the business driver, the data that gets generated, how we process that data, how we turn it into valuable business information. 
uh, that allows us to define and drive new services and revenue. And finally, time to market is really, really important. Um, increasingly, we are thinking in internet time, we can't afford to wait 18 months, 24 months before deploying a new service. So we need to be able to leverage and reuse a lot of the components that we've already built and just adapt those to new services and, and new features. Next slide, please. And that is really where Oracle sees the vision of Java as powering the Internet of Things because we, to enable this functionality, we need a software platform and a technology that can provide uh, a unifying infrastructure to deliver software and services across all these heterogeneous devices. And that is where Java really comes in. It's a robust, proven technology that allows developers and service providers to build and deploy services across a wide range of devices um, in, a, in a robust manner and have these devices interact with each other and with backend services. And this is where Oracle really sees the value of Java and why Java is, is such an important component to make the Internet of Things a reality. Moving on, let's dive a little bit into some of the key benefits of why we believe Java is so important. Um, as I said, software is becoming increasingly relevant and, and a driver for the services in, in the Internet of Things. And so portability of software and the ability to scale your software across different devices and different use cases is key. And Java is the platform to do that. Um, Java provides a large ecosystem of developers and partners um, and a pool of resources that allow you to build solutions very quickly. Java is an end-to-end -end development platform which allows you as a service provider to build services that scale from the device to the back end with the same programming model um, and same technology. Um, very important devices will be out in the field for a long time, typically 5, 10 or 15 years, and they need to be updatable, they need to be manageable. Java allows you to do that in a very robust manner. Um, these devices need to interoperate, need to interoperate between themselves and with backend services, and you really need components that are standardized, that are interoperable, and Java provides that. Java allows you to innovate very fast because it's a very efficient programming model, and that gives you a competitive advantage. You can build products faster with more value and deliver those into the market faster, while at the same time reducing your risk. And finally, Java allows you to very easily reuse components, scale them across your solution or to other solutions, and very easily integrate with the backend. Next slide, please. So Java has been in deployment and is in market, uh, has been in market for many years, and very successful at that. And we're revving that platform, Java ME, to another version, version 8, which we really believe is the next generation software platform that is ideally suited for the Internet of Things. That's coming next year, and so I just want to give you a little bit of an overview of what Java ME8 will be. First of all, we are unifying the Java ecosystem to give developers and service providers a unified platform that allows them to innovate very rapidly and reduce barriers and friction. Java ME8 is a dedicated and optimized embedded platform for uh, the Internet of Things and, and general embedded use cases. And with Java ME8, we can address a wide range of use cases and markets because it's a very flexible platform um, and it can scale down to very small devices as low as 128 kilobytes of ROM, and one megabyte of flash, which is basically a microcontroller on-chip system. So very cheap, very efficient. Um, it's Java ME8 is a modernized platform that is very flexible and has a number of value add features specifically built in for the Internet of Things, for the embedded space, for the wireless space. So it allows you to very rapidly create solutions and software built on this rich platform. The target markets that we're addressing is 
very small devices to sort of mid-range devices, so it's a very broad um, horizontal um, approach that we're taking, covering really a wide range of use cases and markets. We work with partners, as I'll explain later, to optimize and customize uh, the platform for a specific use case and market. And we're really addressing um, sort of general embedded platforms, edge devices, communication nodes, healthcare devices, um, sensors, meters, and, and general Internet of Things um, applications. Next slide, please. One of the examples of a product where Java is really were very well suited, and this is um, you know, the topic of today's webcast, is wireless modules um, and connected devices. Um, and Java is really a very good platform that allows you to leverage existing compute resources of, of wireless modules um, to create easily create um, intelligent and connected devices that allow you to um, provide services to devices very easily, to uh, existing um, hardware, for example, or for new solutions. These wireless modules include a complete Java application platform, so you can very easily take your existing Java development skills and start building embedded software solutions on these devices. And they provide complete software provisioning and management functionality as well. And so they're really ideally, um, ideally suited to very quickly uh, bring intelligence and connectivity to a particular solution or to a market or to a particular use case. And obviously, you know, we've been working with Qualcomm and Jamalto to provide these products. And let's go to the next slide to take a look at the supply chain and how we're partnering in this area. So we have a strong partnership with ARM, obviously, on the, on the CPU, on the architecture side. We're working with Qualcomm to provide our, uh, the, the, to optimize Java for a particular uh, system on a chip solution. We're working with partners like Germalto uh, to build and integrate Java with a particular wireless module or a family of wireless modules. We work with solution partners like ProSyst and Hitachi to create end-to-end -end solutions that deliver services um, into a particular vertical use case. Obviously, we're working with service providers like Deutsche Telekom and AT&T AT to provide the connectivity and management services. And then oftentimes, the, uh, the business data and the, the backend integration and the storage happens on Oracle uh, products and, and enterprise components. Next slide. So that already brings me to the end of my segment. Um, you can find more information on the URLs listed here. A uh, very good introduction is oracle.com slash IoT. You can also follow me on my blog, terrencebar.wordpress.com. Um, I try to keep uh, my audience updated on the latest developments in the embedded Java space. You can find us on the usual social media channels. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Joe. Thank you. Great. Hey, thank you, Terrence. Uh, just a brief introduction. My name is Joe DeCamp. I'm a product manager at Qualcomm in San Diego. Uh, a little bit about Qualcomm. Very quickly, uh, you know, we're the largest, uh, world's largest semi wireless semiconductor company that provides a wide range of chipsets and software solutions across uh, smartphones, tablets, and other wide variety of connected devices. And uh, I'm really focused on uh, this rapidly growing segment uh, of connected 3G and 4G devices. Uh, we call it the Internet of Everything. Uh, you know, others call it machine to machine, M to M, uh, or Internet of Things. And uh, we're we're very excited about the market. A great uh, market opportunity uh, uh, for uh, for these connected devices. Uh, some analysts, uh, next slide, uh, are predicting a big surge uh, next few years of connected devices. Uh, some are saying up to 25 billion of billion permanently connected devices by 2020. So we're very uh, bullish on this opportunity. Uh, uh, the Internet of Everything or Internet of Things is uh, comprised of a you know a wide variety of verticals, uh, you know, from consumer to uh, devices, security, medical devices, home automation, appliances, asset tracking, uh, uh, industrial fleet management, car connectivity, uh, something called uh, telematics. Uh, we're seeing a big trend in the, uh, the area of 
the telematics, uh, you know, we believe a large percentage of cars in the next few years will be uh, connected, uh, not really for safety, security reasons, but also for infotainment services. So just a tremendous opportunity uh, for uh, connectivity and providing, you know, services uh, uh, to vehicles and to other, other uh, end devices. So in terms of uh, technologies and, you know, Cellular is 4G. Uh, there's you know a wide variety of wireless technologies, uh, you know from Wi-Fi low power all the way to cellular and 4G connectivity, you know hundreds of megabit per second. And uh, there's a, there's a really a wide variety of wireless technologies that enable the Internet of Everything. And some of these verticals may be better suited to short range nature Wi-Fi uh, rather than ubiquitous nature, you know, of coverage of 3G. Uh, cellular technologies, uh, we believe, with their you know, tremendous uh, economies of scale. Economies of scale are really well suited to drive the growth of uh, the Internet of Everything. You know, every day I hear, um, you know, a new and interesting, uh, you know, cellular connected device. Uh, you know, uh, uh, just a, I think last week, uh, you know, just the mundane parking meter. You know, it's being we're seeing it being transformed from a really a dumb device to when you add cellular and some intelligence and some software. On it, it's really you turn it into a you know a smart device, and someone some people would say brilliant network device. You know, uh, you know a mundane parking meter can now allow credit card validation, you know, maybe time of time of day or event tariffing. You know, it can notify the maintenance. Uh, you know, when it's out of commission or it needs change to be emptied. You know, with a sensor maybe in the pavement, uh, it detects the presence of the car. It can you know provide uh, drivers you know locations of free free spaces via cloud-based services and smartphone apps. You know, the parking meter can zero out, uh, you know, the meter when the car leaves or notify parking, you know, the meter made of parking enforcement when the meter runs out. So it really provides the city's efficient way of leveraging uh, parking meter resources. So this is just like one example. Um, uh, to do all these types of smart activities uh, in the end device, uh, you know, requires software to run on the endpoint. And uh, we're a strong believer in Java ME is, you know, such a solution to, to enable these types of uh, what we call smart uh, devices. Let's go to the uh, next slide. Um, Java ME, uh, we believe, is very well suited to enabling the cellular uh, Internet of Everything across these uh, verticals I mentioned. Uh, uh, the, you know, the software solutions vary you know, significantly from, from vertical to vertical, from car telematics to these uh, very smart, smart you know, parking meters to healthcare and others, uh, other types of devices. And um, we, you know, we see the Java ecosystem really, you know, has a very large developer community uh, that can support, uh, you know, developers in, across these verticals. And, uh, you know, from basic, you know, data manipulation, you know, very basic processing all the way to much more complex, uh, you know, Java is a great, great solution. Our goal really, you know, last, uh, in the past year is working with Oracle is uh, really to make uh, IOE, you know, Internet of Things, MDM application development uh, on cellular platforms, you know, as easy or even easier than, say, smartphone app, app development. So we now have a sort of platform, software, uh, to really help drive the ecosystem. So we've been working with Oracle uh, to, for all the, to, adapt, to adapt and to you know, tailor, you know, to our chipsets, uh, you know, Java ME, and really to enable this uh, uh, market. Let's go to the next uh, slide, a little bit about uh, our chipsets and solutions. Uh, um, we've got a sort of wide variety of low-end 3G and also uh, some high-tier LT chipsets uh, with Java ME plant. And uh, right now we support uh, commercially on our uh, low, what we call low-end mass market HSDPA. This is uh, 3G. Uh, we support ME 3.2, uh, 3.4. And, and as Terrence mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Oracle is coming out with ME 8. So next year we'll be uh, supporting that and that has some good enhancements uh, versus the uh, current versions of, uh, of uh, ME. And there's, uh, these are chipsets on the left are really our mass market. You know, they've shipped hundreds of millions of devices and really on every network worldwide. And um, we work closely with, uh, you know, module vendors such as uh, uh, Jamalto to really put these technologies into, uh, you know, into the modules to help drive very, very low cost and uh, very high, highly capable uh, Java-enabled platforms. So the chipset on the left, uh, 6270, is a, you know, has a very powerful 400 megahertz processor, it's GPS support. It's, a, it's really an optimized, enable very, very low cost uh, uh, 3G devices. So our goal is to get these devices in all sorts of 
you know, from parking meters to, you know, all sorts of medical devices and asset tracking and all those other verticals. Uh, uh, and this is a really good vehicle to drive that. We have another uh, 3G uh, a device that supports uh, 1X, you know, of, uh, or CDMA, and also 3G, higher data rates, higher tier, runs an ARM 11, and again, uh, driving a little higher tier type products uh, with higher processing capabilities and higher data rate needs. Uh, and a little on the right, the bottom, uh, uh, we have future support and we're planning right now uh, uh, LTE. So LTE, also called 4G, uh, very high speed capability. And we have a high power processor on there, which uh, uh, ARM Cortex A5, very significant process capability, really for heavy duty uh, Internet of Things, uh, Internet of Everything uh, uh, use cases, uh, driving, you know, security, security cameras, all sorts of uh, uh, maybe digital signage, all, you know, all sorts of uh, you know, higher bandwidth and uh, higher tier products. So we're uh, right now in the planning stage for uh, next year with uh, the, uh, the ME8. Uh, Slide five. So we have, a, you know, our approach to um, uh, the Internet of Things, you know, really our goal is to drive, you know, the simplification of, of M2M -M and really to enable um, uh, rapid development. And, uh, eliminating uh, external, eliminating the on onboard processor is really key uh, to drive low cost solutions. So to really drive the mass market, uh, when you can eliminate the, an external processor and run run it right on the on the, the onboard processor on the chipset, it really helps to uh, enable low cost uh, 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 product. You may want to advance it just a little bit. Same slide though, um, and then we have uh, the development platform which is available to really ease or enable rapid development. So uh, we have this, this is a, uh, available through our website. Of, you know, there's details on Qualcomm, uh, IOE uh, development uh, uh, details of the, the platform. But essentially it's a platform with Java uh, that runs you know, with our 6270 chipset and allows uh, customers and, and third parties, uh, software developers, to rapidly develop uh, uh, job applications, prototype them, you know, uh, uh, test them out, test them out on a live network, uh, and really, uh, uh, you know, enable fast, rapid time to market. So that's a really a, a key uh, key driver. Maybe we advance this by a little bit more on the same slide. And then um, what we've done is, uh, you know, with uh, sort of abstracted the uh, lower level, uh, you know, complexity, you know, of, of using interfacing with a, with a, a modem. Uh, very complex wireless uh, technology, and we've extracted extracted it out or abstracted out up. Uh, you know, in Java, you know, it's a it's a great programming language. Uh, um, with JSRs, we we have the uh, you know the full very full complement of J, JSRs, and we have extensions of APIs um, to access sort of the lower level uh, you know modem capabilities, like being able to establish sessions, data sessions, SMS. Uh, provide other sort of functionality, uh, uh, you know, low-level hardware interface, and also fall back to uh, AT uh, commands. Let's go to the next slide. And um, really, the um, um, you know we have a um, the platform. We, again, we've been working closely with Oracle to, to uh, you know test and, and be able to run the uh, the ME the latest ME uh, uh, Software on on our chipsets and really optimized, and you know we support a variety of JSRs, connected devices, SOAP, uh, uh, wireless messaging, uh, APIs, uh, security, location-based uh, location services. Uh, you know all our chipsets have GPS, uh, you know, basically embedded in the in the chipset, so we can provide depending on the application, you know, maybe a uh, medical, you know, uh, life, you know, basically a medical tracking device for. Uh, someone who's in, you know, uh, you know, maybe an elderly, elderly patient tracker can provide all sorts of uh, um, access to sensors on the body, and provide a, you know, location-based services, and provide uh, access to, uh, you know, a wide variety of, uh, uh, you know, uh, location APIs. The um, we've added some new APIs uh, to support, uh, you know, machine-to-machine. -machine. Uh, you know, I've mentioned the ability to access lower-level Interfaces and uh, you know, a lot of AT command pass through, and we've we've added um, you know some uh, PLDC, some other connected device uh, uh, JSRs, and essentially uh, really 
you know, enabling the, the full capabilities of the of the, of the chipset uh, uh, to enable these, uh, and in, in some such a way that you know, uh, you know, you're you're leveraging you know well-known JSRs, and uh, again, the, a lot of the development time is is shortened. You know, we like Java because uh, we're seeing a lot of good feedback from from the ecosystem saying that uh, you know they like Java because they're you know able to it's portable across platforms, and we've, we've designed it so it's portable. It's, you know, there's a large development community. It's, it's easy to develop applications. Uh, you know, because you're abstracting out uh, some of the lower level complexity. And uh, uh, so we're we're very excited about uh, you know having this platform to enable uh, uh, to enable uh, you know these these new smart devices. Uh, as I mentioned, let's go to the uh, the next slide there. And um, so essentially, um, you know, we um, at Qualcomm, uh, you know, we're very strong believers in, the, you know, Internet of Everything. And uh, as, a, as a wireless technology company, we're, we're helping to drive, uh, you know, the, the 3G, 4G connected devices. And, you know, it's wireless, you know, 3G, 4G, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, we like to say it's, uh, it's and I think our, our executives say it's, uh, you know, the largest technology platform in history. There's literally... Uh, you know, billions and millions of devices out there with uh, 3G and 4G uh, connectivity, and the ubiquitous nature of it. Uh, you know, being able to cover you know uh, very large, you know, geographic and population and air coverage. It's, a, it's really a mass market platform uh, that allows. Uh, and there's economies of scale there. You know, we're shipping you know, hundreds of millions of devices. You know, the scale is there to really drive low cost. You know. With we have security. We've got uh, you know, all sorts of uh, capabilities with location-based services and other uh, and onboard processing. And uh, with Java running on the on the processors, uh, uh, you can really you know pull out the full capabilities of you know the the of the uh, Internet of, of Things and Internet of Everything. And uh, so we've got these. Uh, you know, we work. Uh, you know, we continue to work closely with Oracle and and, and, and module vendors such as. Uh, uh, Jamal to help to, to realize the, you know this ecosystem. So we're so very very excited about it. Uh, so with that, I uh, uh, wanted to hand it over to uh, uh, Daxel uh, Hensman out of uh, Jamal to, and he's uh, going to provide a good update on the uh, on the, the module solutions uh, for, for the market. I hand it over to you, Axel. Thank you, Joel. Um, yes. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so let me. Um, we've come from Oracle. Um, Putting Java out there is a really powerful technology, and uh, Qualcomm integrating that um, into their chipsets. And I want to show you a little bit more about how um, you um, can take that um, into your products and bring it out into the street uh, with the technology that we provide. But before we start with that, um, let me just uh, introduce to you Jamalto a little. Um, I assume most of you will have heard of Oracle, and probably many will have heard of uh, Qualcomm. Um, most of you have a, a Qualcomm product in your smartphone and it carries around with you, but you also have uh, most likely a Jamalto product um, on you. Uh, Jamalto um, produces, amongst other things, SIM cards, banking cards, um, secure IDs, and pretty much everyone around the world um, today has one or another Jamalto product um, in their pocket. And a couple of years ago, Jamalto decided it was uh, um, interesting to get into the M2M Internet of Things business by expanding and bringing their secure technology, secure products into the space. And this is when um, Jamalto acquired Centurion, a company that's been in the M2M business for more than 15 years. And all in all, we've probably connected more than 100 million products today using our secure uh, modules and um, solutions. And our customers come from a range of industries, as you've heard earlier. Um, and these are large customers such as Honeywell, um, Audi for automotive. We have Philips Respironics with a healthcare solution, Motorola solutions with ruggedized PDAs, um, and mobile network operators that buy our SIM cards, which are special SIM cards dedicated for uh, machines and industrial requirements. So that today, if you look at our solutions, um, we've got a broad portfolio ranging from hardware um, that I'll explain in more detail to you um, today, and uh, SIM cards, um, cloud platforms that also make it easier to deploy into M solutions, 
and we have the security components that will be really important in the future in the Internet of Things. You know, the Internet of Things collecting all this data about us, making it available, and um, for companies, um, this is secure data about their processes, about their business. In healthcare, it's personal data. Um, in smart homes, it's uh, basically user-generated content about what you and I are doing um, that's being made available to third parties. So security and trust will be a really important feature um, in the Internet of Things. So you've heard modules mentioned a couple of times, and um, I'll just briefly introduce what we're doing with the module. What is an M10 module? Um, so what we do is we take um, a cellular baseband, such as um, the technology that Qualcomm provides, and we package that into an easy-to-use industrial form factor that makes the integration of wireless connectivity into all sorts of devices really easy. Um, so basically, what you're getting when you're buying one of these modules is the power of a smartphone um, in an industrial form factor that you can integrate into almost any machine or any device. Um, the rugged design withstands temperatures um, up to 85 degrees or down to centigrade, down to minus 40 degrees centigrade. Um, it's shock resistant, humidity resistant, um, so that these products really last 10, 15 years out in the field. We also have automotive grade modules that conform to the high quality requirements that um, this industry has, so that at the end of the day, with this small um, little product um, device, you are able to implement better processes or new business models um, in all sorts of industries. So why do we believe Java improves um, the edge device or the fields, uh, the, the assets that go out into the field? Um, as John mentioned and Terence mentioned, you know, initially when we started off putting Java into our products, and this is more than 10 years ago, the idea was to reduce the number of components and to throw out the additional microprocessor by making the processing, the inherent processing capability of the baseband available to the application. And remember, I just said basically you're getting the power of a smartphone that you're putting out into a smart meter or into a parking meter or whatever. And through Java, you can make that processing capability that is available on that um, processor, on that um, baseband, to the application. So now with uh, Java ME uh, 3.2, 3.4, and going forward to Java ME 8, this solution is becoming a lot more powerful. And as Terence said, it allows you to reduce the overall cost of the lifetime of the, lifetime of the product. Um, we've got customers that implemented 10 years ago a solution in Java. Um, they've kept that solution across um, three generations of uh, our hardware product family and um, are now moving to the latest product, still working with this software that was developed more than 10 years ago. And that makes it really easy for them to um, have a predictable uh, business case, to reuse what they've done in the past, it makes them quicker to market, and quicker to market translates to um, a better business case. Also with Java, with a new version, we have much better capability to maintain the device, the software in the field once it's gone out. And we have customers that, that are already sending the hardware out into the field, but still working on the software, and then sending that out to the device um, at a later stage, and that just gives them more time to make um, their hardware, their software, rather to make their software more rugged. And obviously, as Jamalto, we also believe that security is an important um, component, and this is why we um, make the feature, security features available through JSR 177. So now, if you know what you want to connect, um, the question is how you connect. The one thing is the, the, the module, for example, that you're putting into these remote assets, um, such as an excavator, vending machine, a truck, um, and now you want to connect them to your enterprise IT system. And what's very common these days in the M10 business is to use a middleware platform that um, basically normalizes the data that's coming from all these different devices in the field to make it easier to integrate that into an enterprise IT system. Or you may have different generations of hardware um, that also want to need to be integrated. You want to harmonize that before it hits the enterprise IT system. And these platforms allow you to scale very simply and very easily from one device to very many devices. 
and it can be independent of the cellular or the communication technology so that gives you future proofing um, be it 3G, 4G, short range technologies or other communications. And obviously Centurion, we, we believe that this is the way forward. We have a platform that supports this um, path and makes it really easy to connect these devices that are out into the field to an enterprise IT system. So let's look at an example of M2M. Um, in this case, it's called Chain Logistics. And um, our customer would take a module um, and integrate this into uh, a little piece of hardware. Um, in this case, it's um, a device that um, takes temperature reading, location reading, and it even has a little light sensor on it. Um, and this device can be put into any sort of um, package, container, cargo, um, and can be tracked around the world. And the device is then connected to an enterprise or to a uh, tracking solution that allows you to see where in the world this, um, this device and therefore the goods are being transported. You can look at the temperature, um, how that's um, changing, and you can have a whole fleet of these devices and um, look at alarms that come up when the temperature drops below a certain value. And this is going to be very important in the transport of perishable goods, pharmaceuticals, for example, um, foods um, that are being shipped from one country to another country, um, where you want to ensure that the continuous um, cold chain or temperature range is being maintained so that these goods don't perish. And with M2M, it's very easy to implement this. With a platform, it's very easy to integrate this to a back-end system. And all in all, you get something very powerful that enables you to improve your processes and um, um, create even new business models when you're looking at things like automotive, where you want to stream internet to the car, um, or um, street view, connect via Wi-Fi. So now, the question is, how do you get started? And at Jamalto, we also have a developer board um, that uses the um, a Java powered module um, to make the processing capability available. Um, we've added an Arduino interface that makes it really easy to attach different sensors and actuators and to prototype your idea. Um, this board will sell for around 99 euros and will start shipping in January. And it'll, it can be ordered through our Jamalto webshop. What we've also done is we've provided a developer community for those um, that want to get started and uh, learn more tutorials, uh, sample code, and also um, to interact with other developers um, to get started and uh, learn more about this uh, powerful technology. And so when you've got your idea, um, you've prototyped that, you've connected it potentially via a cloud platform such as SensorLogic, the next step um, is probably to go through a terminal, which is basically a certified, approved, ready-to-go, marketable product um, which you can attach to other devices and it has the same module inside so that with Java you're able to take your code that you programmed on the developer board to a terminal and if your product is successful and you want to go mass market, do a custom dedicated design, you can then use a module and you can transfer that code into a module um, to continue with the same code that was originally developed and maybe if you're really successful, you go mass market, um, you source directly from Qualcomm a chipset, you're able to continue with that um, Java code that was originally developed on a prototyping platform in a um, chipset solution. So really the power of Java is that you're able to take um, one idea, um, try it out, and then deploy that to very many devices. So with that, let's go and connect everything in every machine. And um, you're welcome to follow Jamalto on um, the internet, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and read more about us on, on our blog. So with that, um, I'd like to hand it back uh, to Kyle. And I think we're going into a QA and a um, session. Thanks, Axel. We've had a few questions come in. Um, the first one uh, is for Terrence. Uh, so Terrence, um, doesn't Java require a lot of hardware res 
resources, and how much additional hardware cost does Java incur? Yeah, so thanks. Um, I think as we pointed out, um, one of the key benefits of Java is that you can really uh, reuse some of the processing power you already have on an embedded device, such as a, a baseband uh, radio chip. Um, and Java, especially the newer versions uh, coming with Java ME8 next year, is very scalable from very small uh, resource constrained devices up to larger devices. And so your your hardware overhead, your additional bomb cost is actually very low to non-existent. So it's, it's really an ideal solution to add uh, a capable software platform uh, without adding any hardware costs. Okay, thanks. And the next question we have is for Joe. What is the what is driving the growth in 3G connected devices? Well, so the uh, really 3G and you know increasingly uh, 4G, which is you know, LTE, uh, you know, really becoming truly ubiquitous. You know, they're, you have coverage uh, everywhere and. Uh, you know these networks are uh, very, very well developed on 3G, and you know as, as uh, we go forward 4G uh, with these high-speed data services, uh, you know, it's really a, a blanket uh, coverage. You know, b you know, both domestically, internationally, and you know you can go nearly everywhere, and there's a cellular coverage. And uh, you know these devices are, you know, the, the technology 3G is really a, you know, they're mass market. We leverage the, uh, the cellular in industry and, and PC OEM connected devices and other uh, connected uh, types of products, maybe for the consumer or other segments, uh, hundreds of millions of devices. So really, the scale is there. And you know, the past, uh, you know, uh, cellular was really, you know, essentially too expensive or too power consuming. Uh, really, be put in a variety of uh, end devices, and really maybe not practical. Uh, but the uh, you know in recent years the uh, it becomes very low cost, very very small, and also very very low power. So you maybe got battery powered devices that lost you know asset tracking, potentially lost for years. Uh, you know, and then as the as the scale gets there and the low cost become low cost, you can start putting these devices in uh, in everywhere essentially. That's our, really our goal uh, to enable the internet of everything. Uh, you know, again, as Terrence mentioned, the uh, you know with Java running on the processor, we further reduce the the bomb, uh, you know, the bill of materials of the device. Now, instead of having, having we reduce the number of components. So again, cheaper. You know, and, and maybe going back to that 3G cellular parking meter case. Uh, you know, uh, you know, with these low-cost uh, wireless modules, we're you know enabling these brilliant uh, parking meters. Uh, uh, you know, I guess I say it, if you're, I suppose if you're more likely to get a parking meter, you're probably not happy, but cities love it because uh, there's, you know, it's a really a efficient use of parking resources and, you know, allows for rapid ROI on their investments. So I think there's a, you know, the, the, the scale, the low cost, low power, all help them drive uh, uh, the growth in, you know, 3G and, and these types of connected devices. Okay, great. Um, Axel, we have a, a question for you. Which IDEs are supported for the concept board? So yeah, um, for us, um, we've been working with uh, NetBeans and Eclipse, and we provide uh, plugins for both of those. And um, to get started, was really important is documentation and sample code, and um, this is available through a developer forum um, through Jamalto. And um, all in all, that makes it really easy to get started and um, to prototype a couple of ideas. Okay, great. Um, Terrence, we have a, a question for you. Can you go into a little bit why Java is a proper OS for embedded solution if this technology is coming from the PC world? Uh, yes, very good question. So, you know, people tend to associate Java with, with desktop or with, with enterprise level, you know, processing power and, and requirements, but uh, Actually, Java came from the embedded space originally. That's what it was designed for. Uh, it was a, a software runtime for mobile and embedded devices. And now that the Internet of Things is really coming together in terms of processing capabilities and connectivity, um, I think we're seeing Java a, a resurgence in the space because Java is really an ideal fit for, for these types of environments. And as I said before, uh, you know, the newer versions of Java have become very, very, very efficient, very small, very scalable. And so 
um, you can now have the same programming model uh, Java running on very small, very resource constrained devices that are very cheap, you know, in the, in the single dollar range. Um, up to full enterprise level backend systems with you know multi-processing systems and you have the same programming model same concepts across all these uh, platforms and that is a huge huge benefit for the industry great Axel we have another question that came in for you is the concept board supported on all mobile networks yes so at, at Malta we um, we make uh, modules for basically any um, network around the world. Um, we support 2G, 3G, 4G, uh, CDMA networks. Um, the concept board um, has got a module on it that's the EHS 6. It's a 5-band 3G uh, module and quad-band 2G. And it'll work basically on any 2G and 3G um, GSM network around the world with uh, speeds of up to 7.2 megabit in the downlink and 5.7 megabit in the uplink. Um, when you're going, um, remember I said you can go from the concept board then to a terminal and then to a module. So um, we have in the same footprint as the EHS 6 and a uh, more cost optimized version that's the EHS 5. It's a dual band 3G solution that will work in the EU and the US. Um, and we also have a 2G only version um, that's the BGS 5. Um, which is probably very suited for um, the lower cost markets in, in Asia, for example, or South America. Um, but 2G is still used in many networks in Europe. Um, so with that, you get um, Java basically on, on any network um, around the world. Okay. Joe, we have another question for you. What are some of the use cases for Java ME in the automotive space? Okay, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, the um, you know Qualcomm's been we've been involved in the you know this auto it's called telematics uh, you know automotive connected uh, cars and you know uh, for I think we probably for the last 11 12 years and you know, we worked uh, with some of the pioneers uh, GM OnStar to commercialize their first product and so we're right now uh, working with a lot of the uh, uh, you know major uh, auto companies uh, uh, you know and then the tier one suppliers and tier two module vendors to to really drive uh, you know uh, Connected devices and uh, Java ME. I think we so we've seen some interesting uh, uh, you know use cases and you know there's a whole host of uh, enabling the connected car. You've got uh, you know uh, things primarily safety, security. You know the basic. So those are the basics. And then you've got uh, you know infotainment, but things like stolen vehicle tracking. Or, uh, uh, I think a lot of you have seen some of them. The OnStar commercials where you know the, the father's in Europe and he's uh, got a you know you can remote unlock his his uh, daughter's you know his car his, his daughter's been locked out of uh, you know at, across the world uh, uh, you know there's uh, uh, diagnostic services uh, so you know the modules uh, you know are essentially hooked into you know the the diagnostic port of the of the uh, of the car and uh, you can pull diagnostic information you know like sensors any many alarm or any fault that shows up on your in your in your car can now be communicated. Uh, uh, you know, uh, up through you know cloud-based services, uh, you know, and you can be notified email or you know text message, or uh, you can be notified, and you can maybe opt in to have your dealer notified, so you can, the dealer can notify you to make sure oh, you got to bring your car in for some like new service. You know, so there's all sorts of uh, you know, very interesting uh, you know value-add services, and you know Java can be used uh, you know to really uh, enable a, a whole bunch of those uh, uh, types of uh, types of things, and you know in the automotive space. Great. Axel, we had another question come in that uh, hopefully you can answer. Um, does Internet of Things and M2M really need 3G, 4G data rates? Yeah, so uh, good question, Kyle. Um, <clears throat> so tr traditionally, M2M has been very much about uh, you know sending an alarm or uh, just some sensor data across a um, uh, network um, to some back end and um, typically this doesn't require um, the bandwidth of uh, 2G, uh, sorry, of 3G and, and 4G networks. And in fact, initially we saw a lot of um, our customers implement um, their solutions on, on even SMS technology. But, uh, you know, things have moved on and um, there's more and more um, 
devices that are getting connected that um, also need more um, bandwidth. Um, we've just recently launched an LTE solution for Audi, um, where you're streaming internet into the car, street view. Uh, you can have multiple connected devices uh, on Wi-Fi within the car. Um, we've got, um, for example, surveillance um, solutions where uh, video is required as a backup um, channel or even in remote areas as the only channel um, through cellular. Um, you've got uh, vending machines that are getting more and more intelligent where um, you know you want to have graphics, uh, graphical displays updated. Um, You've got uh, billboards also with graphics. Um, so there's a wide range of applications that are emerging that um, send more and more data um, both upstream or downstream. And um, then what a lot of our customers are facing is the question about future-proofing. So remember we said that in many of these cases, um, the, this technology is out in the field for um, 10 or 15 years and networks evolve. So if you're building a solution today, um, you may want to go to 3G or 4G just to make sure that um, you're running, you're implementing a technology that will still be around in 10 years or 15 years' time. And uh, even though your application may not need that uh, high bandwidth. So um, for a wide range of reasons, and this may be use case um, related or future proofing, um, um, our customers are looking towards uh, 3G and 4G um, as a means of connecting their products. Great. Terrence, uh, another question for you. How is Java on an embedded device licensed? Okay, yes. So um, Oracle has a um, straightforward model for licensing. Um, basically, um, every uh, device that runs a Java stack uh, is is licensed, uh, has a per royalty uh, license, uh, sorry, per unit royalty um, attached to it. Um, and if you want specific, it's, it depends on the scenario, you know, the volume um, and various other factors. If you want specifics, then um, I'd recommend you can either get in touch with me or with your local Oracle sales office and they can give you specifics. Okay, thanks. Um, Joe, we had a question come in for you. Will Qualcomm support ME8 with Android? Yeah, so ME, ME8 um, will be supported on you know, our Linux uh, uh, platform. This is a, uh, essentially we have a, a ARM Cortex A5 uh, running on our Linux 15. We're, we're in the planning phases of this for support for next year and we'll align with ME8. But it's a, a Linux, standard Linux kernel and uh, that's the, the current plan. It's very, very powerful. Uh, you know, as I think as Axel mentioned, uh, you know, the, the 4G connectivity, uh, uh, you know, is is being driven, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons. You know, there's single mode uh, 4G and there's a, a multi-mode 4G. You know, backward compatibility to 3G, uh, and uh, there's things like security, digital signage, uh, uh, you know, uh, network access, remote. Uh, uh, Types of connectivity type solutions, and um, our goal is really to, to enable that uh, the Java to run on the run on on our high powered processor. To in those cases where where um, you know there's heavy processing capability uh, needed, uh, you know, for video and other types of applications. Uh, yeah, if, if I can add to that um, answer, it, we get a lot of questions about specific operating systems or specific chipsets or you know specific uh, platforms, and that's I think precisely um, what the industry today is struggling with. Right, there are all these different um, components out there, different platforms, different languages, different tool chains, different operating systems, and that makes it extremely challenging for anybody to build software services services that scale across a wide range of devices. Um, and not only that, it also, as, as Axel hinted to, um, it makes it very difficult to support um, 
devices and solutions over a long time period, like 10, 15 years, because typically you will uh, rev your hardware over time, you might deploy new hardware, um, and if that forces you to redeploy and redevelop your software every time, that's just not a viable business model. So really the beauty of Java, and that's the core message here, is that Java enables you to abstract your software and your services away from the underlying hardware and allows you to build software services and value that scale across a wide range of platforms and you don't have to worry about the underlying hardware and software anymore, right? So, um, for example, we have uh, Java me running on uh, small real-time kernels, um, on different types of processor architectures, on Linux-based systems, as, uh, as Joe hinted to, uh, a wide range of systems. And from a programmer's perspective, from a software development perspective, you only write one uh, application, one software service, and it automatically runs on all these platforms. Uh, very fast time to market, very efficient uh, deployment model, and, and that is one of the key values of Java. Okay, great. Axel, we had a, another question come in for you. Uh, does Jamalto provide cloud-based services for management of the devices? Yes, so um, <clears throat> with the SensorLogic platform, we um, have a solution that you know makes the data that's coming in from the field available in the cloud, and for people to process and, and um, take, and you know we can convert that data into an alarm and hand over an alarm. But also, um, SensorLogic takes care of, of managing um, those devices, um, both on the device layer or connectivity layer. Um, so, you know what we've seen is that. Um, with M to M, these devices are going into the field, and there's um, unlike um, your smartphone or your laptop, there's nobody that's operating this, and you can't just run updates easily. Um, you know, install a new driver or do a reset if something's um, gone wrong with your device. So this needs to be really robust, and you need to have solutions um, that make it easy to manage these devices remotely. And for example, when it comes to connectivity, cellular connectivity, um, we've mentioned that. Um, we've got special form factors, SIM cards that can be soldered into our products. Um, that makes it challenging if you're manufacturing this in Taiwan and you're shipping to the US where you want to be on AT&T or to the UK where you want to be on, and say, Vodafone UK or into Germany and you want to be on T-Mobile. Um, so with our subscription management solution, it makes it um, possible to, over the year, once the device pops up, to say, okay, I want this to be an AT&T device or I want this to be a Vodafone UK device. And I think this, uh, this really makes, it, um, makes logistics for our customers a lot easier because they don't have to keep different variants for different operators. Um, they can deploy much faster and are more flexible. So yes, yes, we, we provide solutions to manage these devices out in the field. All right, great. Uh, we have time for about one more question, and this one is for all of the, the presenters. Um, so we'll start with Terrence and then go on to Joe and Axel. So Terrence, to start off, um, where do you think the value lies across the Internet of Things ecosystem? Uh, in, in, in short, short form, I think I think our speakers think is that yeah, it's really about about driving, driving efficiencies and driving live services and business models. models. If you look at look at the way, the way you know how. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry, I was muted. Okay, okay. Um, I'll um, start. I'll start. Over. Um, um. So, so to me, it's, it's all about, about, about services, services that, that, that are enabled, are enabled and, and the efficiencies and the new business model that the Internet of Things enables and provides. If you look at look at the world today, today it's, it's still fairly primitive, right? We don't really have a good feeling and good integration with what's happening in our business processes in our in the world around us. Um, and the Internet of Things allows us to get better insights to derive meaningful data and then turn around and, and optimize our processes and provide new services that otherwise would be impossible. And to do that, we need a robust software platform to implement these services. And I think that's really where the value comes in, and it's, 
it's it's a very uh, broad uh, value proposition that covers many different verticals, and that makes it so big. All right, thanks, Terrence. Uh, Joe, same question to you. Where do you feel the value lies in the Internet of Things ecosystem? Yeah, I think a large, to a large extent, I agree that the, you know, from the services side, you know, the the, the uh, being able to offer a, you know either a, some some value add service, some recurring uh, service, uh, you know, and depending on the you know the the, the business model, uh, you know, or recurring uh, you know software service. You know, there's a you know as you, when you put this you know software capability, and intelligence in the in the edge, and being able to to uh, process, and you've got a lot more uh, value you can provide. You know, I, I pulled up some. You know, I mentioned some of the uh, you know the, just the parking meter example, and you know all the additional value you can provide to uh, uh, you know to uh, municipalities. Uh, you know, driving, and then also value to the end customer. Now you can you know you provide these services, cloud-based services. You know, to find where there's free parking spaces. So there's a bunch of folks within the ecosystem uh, that can can benefit and offer these services to end customers, and in a lot of cases, uh, you know, they're we think there's value they're willing to pay for a lot of these a lot of these capabilities. So uh, definitely a lot of value uh, in the in the services side. Okay, and same question to you, Axel. Yeah, so I think if you if you look at where <clears throat> the value comes from for the people that want to implement the M2M or IoT solutions, it'll be in, in particularly in uh, process efficiency. Um, so you know, for a lot of companies that are in manufacturing or in delivering goods, providing SLAs, getting a couple of percentage points of of efficiency gain can literally mean uh, millions or billions of dollars uh, saved. So. What I believe is great is that the industry is moving from um, something that was um, you know, very much technology-driven, hardwired solutions to something that's now, for example, with Java, becoming much more flexible, where you're getting the power of, of the, the data that's coming from the field and combining that with big data and an enterprise IT system, and are able to make sense from all of this and create efficiency gains that translate to money saved. And I think that's that's where a lot of the value is going to come from. And then there are new business models that are enabled, um, such as um, you know in healthcare where suddenly you get connected products, um, or as I mentioned, streaming um, internet into the car, which is something that wasn't possible a couple of years ago. So you know there's new there's value coming from new business models that are implemented as well. Okay, that's about all the time we have. I want to thank uh, all three of our presenters, Terrence Barr, Joe DeCamp, and Axel Hansman. And I want to thank everyone for attending Smutter Connected Technology, the direction of Java for connected devices, presented by Jamalto, Oracle, and Qualcomm.